Now that you've found UBN Radio and discovered our quality talk shows, it's time to spread the word to friends, family, and the universe. 24 hours of music and talk. Radio without limits. That's why people keep coming back for more. That's UBNRadio.com. live with Antoine Hawkins. Today we're honored to have in the studio with us Dr. Cecil Murray and Pastor Mark Whitlock. Dr. Murray joined the faculty of USC after retiring from his pat from his post as pastor of the historic First African Methodist Episcopal Church, commonly known as Fame, in Los Angeles, where he was appointed as the John R. Tinsey Chair of Christian Ethics in the School of Religion at the University of Southern California. In addition, Dr. Murray was named the Senior Fellow of the Center for Religion and Civic Culture. He chairs the USC Cecil Murray Center for Community Engagement. Murray holds an earned doctorate degree from Claremont School of Theology and has many years of experience as a senior senior statesman in the African-American community in the city of Los Angeles as a whole. During his 27 years as FAME's pastor, Dr. Murray transformed a small congregation of nearly about 250 people into an 18,000-person church with a multi-million dollar community budget, uh, budget and community and economic development programs that brought jobs, housing, and corporate investment into many South Los Angeles neighborhoods. Many politicians, including former President George W. Bush and President Bill Clinton, visited his pulpit and spoke to the congregation. Murray, though he is retired from ministry, is still a vibrant force with a passion to ensure that the legacy of African-American church leaders of the civil rights generation passes on their years of knowledge, expertise, and experience, spiritual authority, and political pragmatism to the next generation. Next with us this morning, uh, we have alongside Dr. Murray, is Pastor Mark Whitlock. Pastor Whitlock is the executive director of the USC Cecil Murray Center for Community Engagement. He also serves as the pastor of Christ Our Redeemer AME Church in the city of Irvine, California, which he started with only five members and has now grown to more than 3,000 faithful parishioners. Before his full-time call to ministry, he served as the founder and executive director of FAME's Renaissance the economic development arm of the First AME Church, which raised more than $400 million in grants, loans, and contracted service initiatives that created more than 4,000 jobs within South Los Angeles. Um, Fame Renaissance Venture Capital Fund and commercial loan programs funded more than 200 small businesses. Home loan programs created more than three than 200 new homeowners and trained more than 2,000 home loan candidates relative to the process. He also completed his uh, undergraduate degrees at the University of Auburn with a major in religion, and now he is completing, correct, Pastor Whitlock, his MDiv at Fuller Theological Seminary. So I want us all, my international livers, get listeners, to give a great round of applause to Dr. Cecil Murray and Pastor Mark Whitlock for being here with us this morning. Well, gentlemen, I want to thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to come and to be a part of our program. There's a lot going on in the community, a lot happening, not just at the local level, but at the national level. And in our four segments today, we're going to have a discussion relative to economic empowerment. 
what happened and occurred in Charleston, South Carolina, and the state of affairs relative to police interaction with the African American community and how people of faith can engage in the discussion to ensure that there are positive outcomes so that people's lives can uh, be transformed. And I want to do this a little differently. Normally, I have a series of questions that we, you know, try to flow with a follow on the outline. But I want to ask you and start with you, Dr. Murray. Um, tell me a little bit about your call to ministry and your formation. The Puritans who came to America had a way of speaking of the magnetic power of a new persuasion. There is something in you that calls you to the mission. It calls you out of yourself. I know all of us who are in ministry say we have a calling. Apparently some do and some don't. But I think all of us human beings have something of a magnet pulling us it's up to us whether we say yes or no to it. It starts at an early stage, too, so we have a chance to grow as we say yes or not to grow as we say no. All of my life, I have wanted to be a minister, and it has been there 10 years in the Air Force on flying duty. I still wanted to be a minister and here I am today. So I think that calling is speaking to us. It has tongues that speak, and it has hands that open doors. The question is, will you say yes? Did you know at an early age that you were destined to become so influential in Los Angeles in terms of its political landscape? It's strange. When I finished high school, Industrial High School, West Palm Beach, Florida. The yearbook said, uh, as it did its forecasts, Cecil L. Murray is now pastoring a large church in Los Angeles, and he is no longer in the Air Force, but is in ministry. It is utterly amazing. Each time I, I look at it now, because the book is stacked in the garage of all the pictures of our 12th grade graduates and all, that was a prognosis, and I thank them so much. But even as I grew through 6th, 7th, 8th grade, I was the pastor of the youth church at uh, Payne Chapel AME in West Palm Beach, Florida, and the aspiration, the magnet, pulled me into it. Wow. So, Pastor Whitlock, undoubtedly, you've served Pastor Murray as a mentee. He's been your mentor. When did you come on board uh, and engage him in mentorship? In my mid-20s, I was probably going in the wrong direction. I probably I was going in the wrong direction and uh, kind of had more street cred than I had uh, scholastic achievements. And he really helped me to become proactive instead of reacting. <laughs> Bless you. Thank you. Reacting to what life offered or didn't offer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what prompted both of you? I want to kind of change the narrative a little bit because fame was known, and I have not followed it since you've uh, you know, moved on and retired from ministry. But fame was a powerhouse relative to political activism and economic and community empowerment for people who are marginalized, particularly with particular emphasis, I think, with people of color. But we know that uh, you have a pastor, as the pastor of fame, uh, Dr. Murray, you had a broad scope and reach to different communities, which is very important. What prompted you to engage in economic empowerment for people of color? Necessity was the prompt. I think the church exists not only within the walls, but beyond the walls. It is a church that has no mission, no purpose, if it only exists within the walls. Yes, we must have worship. Yes, we must have the spirit present. Yes, we must be a fellowship and God will take care of us. But God also has a calling beyond the walls. 
God is in the delivery business, and God asks us to join in the delivery business. Jesus, why have you come? I have come to give life to the lifeless, to lift the fallen, to give sight to the blind, to give food to the hungry, to give hope to the helpless. That is our mission. Far too often, of course, we get stuck within the walls, and the calling is beyond the walls. So on the back of our bulletin each Sunday, we would list the 40 outreach programs from Skid Row to the homeless, to the prison ministry, to the foster care ministry, to education and so forth, and ask each member of the church to join one of those task forces. So we had 40 task forces beyond the walls and 40 within the walls making the church go. And that's how we had a collaboration between the pulpit and the neighborhood. You know, Dr. Murray, um, you come from a, a different generation than the generation that you've preceded this current generation. And, of course, the ideology, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, with what I call my mother's generation, my grandmother's generation, relative to the importance of the church, a lot of people question if that ideology is still alive and well, not just in the black church, but just in church general, because of all of the changes that we have in society. Um, Pastor uh, Whitlock, as a mentee, does your church engage in this type of ideology that Dr. Murray just um, talked about? You must come out of yourself into the greater self of God. If you fail to see that the soul of the saint is inextricably bound to the soul of the community, then you miss the real call of the church. You, risk, you miss the real call of the ecclesia, the, the church of God in Christ. So we must, as our fo- one of the founders of Methodism would say, you have to have the Bible in one hand and the newspaper and in the other. In other words, it's not enough just to preach Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's not enough just to bring somebody to salvation for heaven. But how do you provide salvation on earth? And you do that by creating jobs. You do that by helping a small business find equity as well as debt capital. You do that by training uh, people who to move out of becoming renters, move out of just simply renting a home but owning the home that they rent. And so it's it's really an ideology that would suggest it says, yes, we must eat fish, yes. But uh, don't wait for someone to give you a fish. Learn how to fish, but not only learn how to fish, own the pond from which you fish. And then once you own the pond from which you fish, understand the political process in order to make sure that the legislations that the legislation that controls the pond is in favor for you. So we must get involved with the public sector and we must understand the private sector. Do you think that that's happening on a broad on a broad uh, basis in the African American church? In the African American church as well as the Latino church got caught up uh, like the white church of, of old. Uh, the economic bubble that took place in the 90s, the economic bubble uh, that took place before 2006, seven benefited the church. Now you find pastors driving big Rolls Royces, riding, mo- riding multi-million dollar planes, supposedly go save the, the souls of the saints, and, and, and they're living in mansions. Well, Jesus Christ said the, the Son of God has no place to lay his head. Uh, and so this whole concept of prosperity preaching, this concept of making all the money in the world while your parishioners are giving $5, taking a bus to church, and you riding in a benzo, wearing designer suits, flashing designer uh, watches, and all of them too yellow, but you're too yellow to speak truth to power. And the real problem is if the pastor is called to speak for the least, the left out, the left behind, then how can he relate to them when he's acting more like Donald Trump than he is Jesus Christ? And, Hulk, we are having a problem with that in American churches. Time magazine has been carrying the breakdown of Christianity in America. 96% of Americans believe in God, but at this tick of the watch, 50% of Americans will say, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. They don't like the way we denominations work out God. They don't like the way our faith-based systems are systematized for self rather than beyond self. Right now, there are 570 uh, 
million nuns, as they are, are called, excuse me, 57 million nuns. They, they, they are called nuns, not these holy women who give their lives to God, but N-O-N-E-S. What's your denomination? None. What's your church? None. <laughs> What's your faith system? None. 57 million 57 Americans. Million. And the dropout rate in American churches is 60%. Pastors are all crying now because those pews are sending a message. And the message they are sending is, you must be for real in order for us to be sustained. We can do bad all by ourselves. Is it an issue, Pastor Whitlock, of the church has lost its prophetic voice? Absolutely. I, I would think Eddie Glaude out of Princeton out of Princeton would suggest that the church has lost not only the prophetic voice, but is no longer the repository for information in the black community. The black community no longer looks at the church as a place that you come for help and no longer looks at the church as a place where you would have a person in the pulpit willing to speak truth to power. As a matter of fact, we've been co-opted in the Bush years when the faith, uh, the faith relationship with government takes place. Now you would find those churches Churches who were mega churches receive money from the federal government, free money from the local government, and they won't want to bite the hand that feeds them. So they don't speak truth to power. They become much like what took place in the Roman government in 325 A.D. when when the, when Constantine co-opted the church, and once he co-opted the church and made the church a part of government. Now, instead of fighting government, instead of standing up for the poor, instead of standing up for the low to moderate income people as well as the bottom of the pyramid people, now we're acting just like the political oligarchies who are benefiting from the backs of poor people instead of lifting poor people to get off of their backs and become part of the uh, a part of those who excel in this country instead of instead we are stepping on their backs the church is stepping on their backs just like political oligarchies you know that's a very very good point but dr murray doesn't the congregation the parishioners have a part to do in the in the challenge i don't like to use the word problem <laughs> but in the challenge relative to holding leadership accountable. And accountability is one of the greatest problems we have with our human nature. The Bible opens up with myth, which is not fairy tale, but it's a way of expressing something that really can't be expressed without a picture. Here you have a garden existence given to you but there's a snake in the garden, and you are listening to the snake rather than the one who has given you the garden. We have a way in religion of instead of seeing the meaning of the word religion, French religaire, mean the pieces fit, just like shalom means the pieces fit, just like we, we health, W-H-O-L-T-H, Holth, the pieces fit. We make the pieces misfit because we are always fighting against each other instead of fighting with each other and for each other. In the last 4,000 years of history, we've had less than 300 years of peace, and most of these wars were religious wars. We can see in the Middle East right now how we are having trouble with religion. And we are looking at a religion that is supposed to be based on peace, named for peace, but its right-wing conservative element beheading people, killing women and children. That is our history. And the greatest struggle we have with putting the pieces together is not causing the pieces to go to pieces. If, if we if to extend this conversation, and he's mm -hmm. absolutely right, because the church is going to pieces. We're losing more than we're taking in. And the real challenge is if we if we look at old school church, old school church had a pastor who was more educated than anybody else in the church. He had more money, if you look at him in the 30s and the 40s, because he had this big fat belly and his cross would stick on, on the top of the big fat belly with the, with, the thick, with the thick neck. Why the big fat belly suggested 
the in the thirties when nobody else was eating, he was eating. So he had a fat belly, and he had his pencil protector, po- pencil pocket protector in his in his in his outer uh, jacket, and that would suggest that he knew how to read and write. Why? Because ninety percent of the congregation couldn't read and all write, right? And that was in the 30s and the 40s. And sometimes, and, 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 and pastors weren't paid a lot of money because people didn't make a lot of money. And so they would have these great pastor appreciations, and, and they would give them buckets of money because they supposedly didn't make a lot of money throughout the year. Well, sometimes we're using that same old school kind of mentality, that same old school method in new school reality, where now in most churches, 99% of the people have a high school education. 50% of the people have a uh, uh, some, type, uh, of some college. type of college in, in advance. And so here you got a pastor up there uh, preaching and acting like he's having an asthmatic attack. <laughs> and people are going, what the hell is going on? And then number two, in the old school, because the pastor was probably the most educated, they depended on him. So he ran the church like a sole proprietorship, right? He had the checkbook. He raised the money. He, and I keep saying he because it was mostly the Full, mostly Employment, Act, yeah. Full Employment Act for men, which is crazy in the first place. And so now you're running the church without any transparency, right? And so now we find in the 21st century with people who are educated, people who are running multi-million dollar corporations or budgets in their private job, now they come to the church and they find that the church is still run like a sole proprietorship, where in reality it is a public it is a public benefit corporation. It is a 501c3 and the checkbook should not be in the pastor's pocket. We Everybody should get a financial report. Everybody should have a responsibility of reporting, learning what's going on in the church. And and the failure with the church today is, is that we don't have transparency. The failure with the church is we still have these demagogue pastors who are running the church as if it's their own private chiefdom, where in reality that does not fit in the modern method of running church or business. Well, that's a good point. And we're going to uh, end right there and take a station break. I want to tell you we're having a great conversation uh, this morning with Dr. Cecil Murray and Pastor Mark Whitlock. We're going to take a station break, but you come right back to Talk Back Live with Antoine Hawkins. Welcome to the new sound of online radio. Welcome to the sound of Universal Broadcasting Network. Anywhere. This is your sound. This is the sound of Universal Broadcasting Network at UBNRadio.com. Sound of the funky drummer. Music hitting your heart because I know you got a soul. Hey, hey. Listen if you're missing, y'all. Swing it while I'm singing. Hey. Give it what you're getting. Know what I'm knowing while the black band's sweating. In the rhythm I'm rolling. rolling. Got to give us what we want. Uh. Got to give us what we need. Hey. Our freedom of speech is freedom of death. We got to fight the powers that be. Fight the power. 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 We got to fight the powers that be. As the rhythm's designed to bounce with health and mental life Designed to fill your mind now that you realize the prize arrives We, we got, got to pump the stuff to make it drop From the heart it's a start of work of art to revolutionize Make a change, something strange People, people, we are the same, no we're not the same Cause we don't know the game, what we need is awareness We can't get careless, you say what is this? Yeah. I'm beloved, let's get down to business Mental self-defense or fitness, no less to show Welcome back to Talk Back Live with Antoine Hawkins. We have in studio with us today Dr. Cecil Murray and Pastor Mark Wicklock. Whitlock, we're uh, having a wonderful conversation uh, around um, the church, its purpose, and its call and its duty. In this second segment, I want to pick up the conversation relative to Charleston, South Carolina. At the Nuremberg trial, Supreme Court Justice Robert Jackson, who was the chief U.S. prosecutor, said that to initiate a war of aggression is the supreme international crime. 
How do you empower scholars, Dr. Murray and Pastor Wicklock, and our students at the Civic for Religion and Civic Culture to fight back against overt and microaggressions that are tied to patriarchy, white supremacy, racism against people of color and women? I think a beginning point, and I'll let Mark take that second point, okay. but a beginning point is forgiveness. Forgiveness has the capacity of sensitizing self, even as you forgive other selves. There is the forgiveness that is internal, and there is the forgiveness that is external. Now, how can this young man of 19 years of age walk into a church, this Dylan Roof young man, shoot the pastor and eight members. Other members, correct? Yes. And then, as the days go by, the members collectively say, we forgive you. We forgive you. Now, the forgiveness and justice must go hand in hand. That can't be just forgiveness alone. That must be justice. Dalan must stand before the court, the bar of justice. They must act to see that justice is done. But the forgiveness is done. They have internal forgiveness where the one who is smitten forgives the offender without them asking for it. This was internal forgiveness. Then you have external forgiveness where you forgive the offender who asks for forgiveness. On the cross at Calvary, we saw where the founder of Christianity exercised internal forgiveness and external forgiveness. One of the thieves you're supposed to be such a great savior and all. Save yourself. And while you are at it, save us. Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. In other words, they're ignorant. We will always find those who are ignorant who will cause you pain. But if there is this forgiveness before it's asked for, internal forgiveness will stand. Then external forgiveness, the other thief. Man, why are you jumping on this man? He hasn't done anything. He doesn't deserve to be here. But you and I, we have done wrong, and we deserve to be here. Father, will you remember us when you come into your kingdom, O heavenly one? Jesus says today, you shall be with me in paradise. External forgiveness is asked for and it's given. We must find a way to forgive and we must find a collateral way to have justice. The two go hand in hand. But to go about angry, hostile, because you've been mistreated all of your life, that's not helping the situation at all. On the other hand, to be a punk, I know you can do anything you want to hurt me. I don't, it don't matter. Then that is not helping either. Before you respond, Pastor Whitlock, I, uh, Dr. Murray, I hear you on the forgiveness um, uh, thought process, and forgiveness is a very, very powerful tool to bring people to, for lack of a better word, deliverance. Pastor Whitlock, since she has asked you to uh, handle the latter part of the question that deals uh, with patriarchy and white supremacy, racism against people of color and women, I'd like to ask you, uh, to, uh, before you answer this, does justice, or let me reframe it this way, is it important sometimes for justice to precede forgiveness? They both go hand in hand. Justice would suggest that um, that that there is this um, hearing on both sides, 
and they both realize that there is a problem and justice prevails. If justice does not prevail, as we learned in 1992, there will be no peace. And there is no peace in this country because justice has not prevailed. And forgiveness is certainly necessary if you're going to fight a fight. Uh, I cannot be angry with you and whip you if I'm mad at you, because if I'm mad at you, then my thoughts are confused. So my forgiveness is for me, not for you. I'll forgive you for what you did because I'm getting ready to whoop your ass. And so as we think about the forgiveness, the transfer, the benefit of those who are forgiving, it the, the people I'm forgiving, I'm getting ready to whoop your ass. And so the challenge that we are faced with in the 21st century is, it, particularly in Charlotte, uh, where that took place, it, it, is that it was the first time in the 21st century a white police officer was was a what was was con, not convicted but certainly has has been arrested and has been jailed for the murder of a young man a young man who was walking away and who was shot eight times for failing to pay child support and they arrested the the police officer for murdering this young man now we have to deal with that because the pastor of 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 Emmanuel Amy Church is an elected official and the pastor, and he was the greatest advocate for the arrest and certainly moving towards the conviction of this police officer. Now Bethel, not Bethel, but but Emmanuel Amy Church happens to be the seat of the civil rights movement in in the Carolinas, and so when they chose when he chose this place, it wasn't just by happenstance, and you have to take a look at him going downstairs to the pastor's Bible study. In the pastor's Bible study, that's why you had so many different uh, police, had, had so many different pastors and ministers in that Bible study. And so here we find these gracious men and women, pastors, uh, ministers of the gospel, allowing him to come into the Bible study. And then evil certainly takes place, and we murder nine people, and he unloads, he, he unloads a, a clip, and he reloads five times. So, so, we, so, so here's the real challenge. The larger challenge that we're faced with in this country, and we got to wrestle with it, is that 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 the white eurocentric european community is now becoming the minority and they are they are not only are they going to be outnumbered demographically uh, numerically by latinos and african americans but now the seat of power by the name of barack the seat of power the white house the congress the senate and you're going to start seeing a change in the power structures. And so you're going to see more and more supremacists, white supremacists, who are absolutely frustrated with what's happening in this country. We see it echoed in Donald Trump. He's speaking for a lot of people in this country because he sees the change in demographics. He sees the change in the way people are dealing with uh, police officers who have always historically been the seat of power, particularly in low to moderate income communities. And we don't see anybody else getting shot. We see only African American men today. Yesterday, an African woman, woman in L.A. was killed by the L.A. Police Department, and so now we see this shift, this shift of of, of not only ethnicity, of race, and power in this country. And yes, justice will not prevail until we see the white community accept the fact that they are now the new minority. And the same way that racism is an enduring challenge. So is greed an enduring challenge. Persons of any sense at all know that we ought to have requirements for a person to obtain a gun, a weapon. But the National Gun Lobby is so strong, they keep opposing it and opposing it. We know that a person should be able to pass a mental test in order to get to a bear gun, arms. to bear arms. We know that a person should not have a criminal record and is allowed to bear arms, but yet we can bear buy arms just about anywhere we want to, and the country is on hold subject to the gun lobby. Instead of protesting, we must have civil common sense 
and selling weapons. There are 350 million Americans, and there are 400 million guns in this country. So perhaps that may work, but the fact is you're never going to get them 400 million guns. Unless we begin, <laughs> They're going to be out there, right? Unless we deal with public policy and transform this country and realize that justice is only realized when, we, when, when whites begin to see themselves as the minorities in this country, we will find peace. You both are speaking towards uh, structural deficits that exist in society are relative to not just people of color, but relative, you've touched on greed as an example, to ensure that there is enough food for people to have, that people can have a life that is um, in the pursuit of happiness, as it were. Um, How do we overcome these structural deficits, either of you? 30 million Americans go to bed hungry every night in the richest, most powerful nation in the history of the world. We are growing in ways, but we are not growing in other ways with racism. Our nation was founded on that, one of that as one of the principles. The first five presidents owned slaves. The Constitution, most powerful parchment in our nation, looked upon blacks as three-fifths of a person as they counted the population to see what kind of representation they would have in, in Congress. Blacks, slaves, built the infrastructure of this nation. Blacks built the White House, slave labor, Now the White House is the black house, and the white majority has a decision to make because, as Mark has intimated, by 2050, for the first time in the history of our nation, whites will be in the minority. Blacks and browns will be 52% of the population. So a certain segment of the power elite, whites, are determined You may outnumber us in numbers, but you will not outnumber us in power. So they will begin to entrench themselves to make certain they hold that power. If you look at corporate America, at the level of vice president and above, 97% of those executives are white males. And of the remaining 3%, 50% of white females put there by affirmative action. Blacks and browns are at the bottom, moving numerically to the top, and those at the top, the power elite, who have no conscience about power, those are the ones who are the challenge. Dr. Murray, we have about, um, before we go to station break, maybe about three minutes I want to ask you both a question, and either of you can weigh in. Given the reluctance of any system that perceives itself as functioning and profitable to change, I personally worry quite a lot that you have two nations within the community that are destined to stay two nations separate. You have the rich, as you've so eloquently said earlier, Pastor Whitlock, the Ogliarchs, the plutocrats, and all that goes into that. And then you have everybody else. Um... Two nations are defined a lot of times by class, by how much economic power one has. Are you optimistic, either of you, that we can overcome where we are currently and that there can be a blending of cultures that really, 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 as Dr. King says, values people on the content of their character instead of the color of their skin to ensure that everyone is empowered? so that everyone can have positive outcomes for their lives. I'm completing a degree degree at USC within the um, social entrepreneurship. In the Marshall School, we have a master's of social entrepreneurship, a master's of science, and I graduated Mm -hmm. in May. Oh, well, congratulations. Thank you. And (laughs) and corporations are now looking at how do they become more transparent? How do they invest money into uh, the low to moderate income communities and bottom of the pyramid communities? Okay. Um, And... In, in other words, I can do good and I can do well at the same time. I can do well, I can do good at the same time. I can, and instead of just as Milton Freeman would say out of the University of Chicago, who was the guru of business, I can maximize my shareholders' return and at the same time provide a way to invest into service contracts to 
low to moderate income communities, small businesses, and help them to create jobs and improve the infrastructure, make life better within the inner city. Because there's so many negative externalities that exist within low to moderate income community. If you ever go into South Central Los Angeles, here in Los Angeles, you will find that there's a McDonald's, Burger King, Jack in the Box on every corner. But if you go into uh, uh, Beverly Hills, or if you go into Brentwood, Orange County, LA. Brentwood, or mm-hmm. Orange County, you won't find those fast food places. And so, and and fast food creates obesity. Fast food has all types of litter on the ground. Fast food uh, makes very low wages for people who work there. So, yes, I'm extremely optimistic. Now, on the other hand, African Americans and Latinos, we have the lowest uh, matriculation rate in the in, in, in the college, and we have the lowest graduation rate. We have the highest dropout rate in high school. And unfortunately, that exists in the 21st century. We did better coming out of 1954 and the civil rights movement than than we're we're doing doing now. now. And so we have to focus on both sides of the coin, right? We have to protest and make sure that we march and make sure we hold uh, uh, corporations accountable, government uh, transparent. But at the same time, the African-American and Latino community must, must go to college. We must finish high school. We must excel. We must start businesses. We must find a way to partner with uh, business, and we must become a part of the global community. If we are not part of the global community, we're going to fail. And you ask about optimism. Optimism is fine, but we probably will replace optimism with peptimism. We need the energy. We need those who are in the white power elite to realize that under the skin all people are kin when we march and protest nonviolent protest must be there and we must have it as multiracial multicultural we are seeing in the murder of young adult black males by the police power that in the crowd there are non-blacks there are whites there are Asians who walk with us and and talk with us. Optimism is not alone enough. We've got to have the energy, the synergy, the focus there. We've got to walk together and work together or else we will self-implode. And that is the danger of our nation with liberty and justice for all. We've got to make certain it is for all. We can do it. We can do it if we have that peptimism. And that's a good point. We're going to uh, take a station break on that point. We have here in studio with us today, Dr. Cecil Murray and Pastor Mark Whitlock. You're listening to Talk Back Live with Antoine Hawkins. We'll be right back after this quick station break. Now that you've found UBN Radio and discovered our quality talk shows, it's time to spread the word to friends, family, and the universe. 24 hours of music and talk. Radio without limits. That's why people keep coming back for more. That's UBNRadio.com. Let me see you move. to talk back live with Antoine Hawkins. We're picking up the discussion with Dr. Cecil Murray and Pastor Mark Whitlock. In this final segment, we're going to talk about some current affairs. And I want to start off by asking you both, what do you think about the presidential race? 
who will support the interest of the people, Clinton, Trump, Sanders, or others? We are a nation that's holding its breath because as we go into the 21st century, we are faced with the challenge of will you walk together or will you continue your habit of walking separately and apart? The right-wing conservatives are really making their position clear. Southern Poverty Law Center, which specializes in such matters, says since 2008, with the election of our first black president, threats against the president have increased by 400%. Secret Service, FBI say every single day there are 30 genuine threats against the president. Barack Obama has done a superb job, and in maybe 25 years, 50 years, he'll be remembered as one of our great presidents. But right now, there's a segment of America that looks at him and sees the color of his skin, and nothing he does is going to be right. They have looked for a way to impeach him. They have looked for a way to throw away his signature movement of the health care movement. Mm -hmm. Nothing is right, and therefore we have become very cynical and this liberty and justice for all, this all of us are created equal, is something that we have really just thrown away. Now, this election in 2016 will be pivotal because with the 17 candidates in the Republican Party and the Republican Party being pulled further and further to the right, the Tea Party took over, and now we are looking at that we are going to see where we are. You know, it, 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 Rubio is, is a good candidate, no question. Um, I think for the Republican Party, and, and particularly the Latino community, I think Rubio speaks uh, eloquently, and uh, he seems to have a, fair, a fairly good grip on not only international politics, but also the challenges that face our country. And... And, and, and Donald Trump, I think he's kind of a, an entertainer, and, and he knows he's going to be um, out after a while. So it's wonderful for him to get things going. I, I, I think America is, 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 is certainly looking for change. Uh, Hillary Clinton, female, I, I would love to see another woman, to be honest with you, only because uh, the Clintons, the Bushes, we've had them. It would be wonderful to get a breath of fresh new air. Okay. But—, but 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 Hillary uh, represents not only um, a tried and proven leadership model for this country under Bill Clinton, we did well. So she understands leadership. She also understands, quote unquote, forgiveness. But she represents women. And I think women must be given an opportunity to lead this country. Men have done a wonderful job messing it up. And, and, and it's now time for real change to take place. So I'm looking... I, if I, if I, and, and I hate to do this still soon, but I'm throwing my hat in with Hillary Clinton. Okay. Many senior black leaders um, have been saying it's time for the president to specifically speak to a black agenda. Mm. Uh, if either of you had the opportunity to have a sit down one on one with the president, what would you tell him? I would say, well done, Mr. President. Well done. You cannot be the black president, you must be the president of the nation. You have shown that you are a multicultural person, a multi-ethnic person. Well done, that's what our nation must have. If you were to concentrate wholly on the black underserved component, then the white majority would rally against and we'd be worse off then than we are now but you have been there. He was there when the, with the Charleston event to work with the people there. He was there 50 years after the Civil Rights Act because the Supreme Court has pulled out Section 4 of the, Civil, uh, of the Voting Rights Act 
and we are really in trouble now because states may use their own judgment about voting rights and so forth. We are moving forward and we are moving backwards at the same time. We are going to have to find a way to make a way to be not the melting pot, but the salad bowl. That melting pot symbol is what has kept us there. You put everything in the melting pot, then when the heat is on, everything blends to the dominant culture, which is white males in America. So instead of the melting pot, we look at the salad bowl with lettuce and carrots and radishes and all, and let us teach us to say, let us, not let me. I, I think the challenge and that we face. We have about four minutes, Pastor. Okay, the, the challenge that we face is that when Tom Bradley ran the church, ran, ran the city, the of, city Los of Los Angeles, Angeles, the black community went down the drain. It, it did. If you look at South Central Los Angeles, he got elected because of the Watts riot of 50 years ago. But if we look at the Rodney King challenge, it was because not enough attention was placed in the African-American community. Okay. Tavis Smiley, Cornel, uh, Cornel West have done a good job agitating and they sometimes irritating the president of the United States. Jeremiah Wright had it right. It is the responsibility of black leadership to irritate, agitate leadership, no matter what color they are. Yes, Barack Obama could do a better job. Yes, Barack Obama could mobilize black leaders and sit down and come up with an agenda to deal with the challenge of black, I'm sorry, not the challenge, but the real problem that black the lives realities. do. The reality is black lives do matter, and we have a black president, and he could do more. Well, you know, that's a two perspectives. I love it. That's what we're about. Um, so tell me in our last three minutes, what do you all have going on? How can people contact you? Are there any current events that you have happening? What's happening in your communities? In our communities, the Black Lives Matter is really a matter of great importance, and several of our mega churches are moving forward. Uh, the National Action Network uh, is, uh, yes, is, is doing quite well. Uh, and I think the whole, the, the larger black community is saying we must protest and we must protest nonviolently. We cannot have fires and looting and stealing and all that isn't there, but we must protest. And then the women's rights movement they will slide over to it with a good extent to assist us up and coming immigration. The Latinos, a certain percentage of them will be there as we uh, for fair immigration and so forth. Okay. Two things. Uh, one, uh, on uh, the 30th of this month, we have the uh, Bishop of the Catholic Church. Oh, wow. Coming to preach at our church. Uh, our address is 45. Uh, Tesla in Irvine, California, 45 Tesla. And this is the first time a Catholic uh, uh, bishop has come to preach at an African Methodist Episcopal Church in California. So we are crossing denominational. That is significant. Uh, number two, on October 2nd and 3rd, our church is hosting the, the National Faith Leadership uh, Conference, where we're bringing in national speak spokesmen from spokespeople from uh, the White House and various people. So everybody is, is welcome to come. We have church every Sunday. We want people to come, and, and let's make church look like heaven. Uh, because heaven is fully integrated. And so, <laughs> but when you come, you're not going to, Pastor Mary taught me this, you're not going to come and practice the 11th commandment. Uh, as a matter of fact, the Which 11th is. commandment is, thou shall not be boring. Oh. And so <laughs> you're going to come in and Wonderful. have a good time shouting and playing. And they will find out that the typical black church is open to all. To all, correct. Thank you for this opportunity. Well, thank I want to thank both of you for such a wonderful Bless interview. You. It was good to have you on the program. Uh, if anyone is trying to get contact with Pastor Whitlock, his email address is www.corechurch.org. That's not the email. The email is I'm, I'm Mark sorry, the, W. Um, at the Core Church. Website. Yeah, I'm looking at the website. website. <laughs> <laughs> Corechurch.org. Well, we want to thank you so much for being a part of Talk Back Live with Antoine Hawkins. Until next week, join us live. Have a blessed day.
Welcome to the 